안녕하십니까 남성치과 김기성 원장입니다. Greetings, I'm Dr. Kim Gi-sung of Namsung Dental Clinic. Today I'd like to discuss top-down approach as part of our master course. We always talk about how important top-down treatment is. Then what is top-down concept? Top-down concept is to plan from crown part to ensure the ideal shape and perform the surgery so that the implant is placed according to the plan, the position, and shape. In other words, instead of placing implant, then choosing an abutment and making prosthesis, so we start from the diagnostic and treatment planning stage by first selecting the crown and then placing the implant in the ideal position. You don't go bottom up, you go top down. We need to focus on implant prosthesis, but this is not always possible. The prosthesis that is desired is like this, and below that, the goal is to place appropriate implant below. But this is only possible in certain conditions, so we need to consider various scenarios based on this treatment plan. When thinking about the suprastructure, we need to think about various factors like the type of prosthesis material, first, and then determine the implant placement position. Let's look at the top, the shape of prosthesis. The goal is to create a prosthesis that is identical to the natural lost tooth. We need to replicate features like central groove, lingual cusp, and buccal cusp. This is what we refer to as neutral zone. Based on this design, we first make and fit provisional, although not always. At times, we need to provide a prosthesis for the upper and lower at the same time. We need to use provisional to check a causal relation, masticatory function, and identify potential issues. When cusp offset is not properly adjusted, a cheek biting can happen. Or tongue biting can happen too. If the position is wrong, the patient may feel discomfort in the tongue. We need to set first using provisionals and then find the right form of a prosthesis. After making adjustments, we need to make final prosthesis. That is the reason why we use provisional restorations for a certain period of time. We consider different factors to adjust the prosthesis. Next is prosthesis type. I'm sure you've heard of it in numerous lectures, but the prosthesis type can be divided into screw, cement, and ER type. The ER type is used most frequently these days. We need to consider vertical space. In terms of implant placement, I often mention this. The implant needs to be in the bone, and the implant top should have at least 3 millimeters of space from the gingival line. This is referred to as IS or H2. The space from the implant to soft tissue is referred to as H2 or IS. From the implant top to the antagonist, a total space needed for prosthesis is labeled as H1. Here it is marked as IO. It is distance from the implant to the occlusal plane. These are the three factors that should be considered upon implant placement. The implant needs to be inside the bone. There needs to be three millimeters of space with gingival margin. And from implant top to the antagonist, there needs to be over nine millimeters of space. Regarding figures for implant prosthesis, H3 and MO. This is distance from prosthesis margin to the antagonist. This is net space for prosthesis. The distance from the implant to abutment margin is referred to as IM. This is gingival height. 
Uh, these two figures are related to prosthesis fabrication. We've talked about prosthesis type and space for prosthesis. At times, you need to use screw type prosthesis. In most cases, I do not find screw type prosthesis fit for internal type implants, but if the vertical space is extremely limited, you need to use a screw type. When can you use screw type prosthesis? A lot of people say that if the distance between the implant abutment to the antagonist is less than 5.5 millimeters, then screw type should be used. I personally do not agree. When implant is placed from the implant top to the antagonist, this is I.O. which was described previously from the implant to the antagonist. If it is less than 5.5 millimeters, then you need to end up with a screw type prosthesis. By screw type, UCLA abutment is used, PFG gold is used, and on top porcelain is added. It is this kind of prosthesis. Personally, an internal type, screw time can be very unfavorable in terms of retrievability. I've never used screw type for internal implants. The precondition is that the implant has been placed with less than 5.5 millimeters of space. I've mentioned this previously. In treatment stage, we need to secure at least 9 millimeter of space. That is why I have never ended up with a space that is less than 5.5 millimeters, and I have never used screw time. This kind of prosthesis can be observed frequently in dental hospitals where implant placement and prosthesis are fabricated separately by different departments. If the vertical space is less than 5.5, you need to use screw type. If possible, you need to avoid this. In designing prosthesis, we need to consider the materials used. From the abutment margin to occlusal plane, which is a combination of abutment height and occlusal thickness, these are the materials used. Personally, I like gold. As of late, it's very difficult to use and it's unesthetic as well. However, when the space is minimum, at times you can utilize it. The most frequently used option is full zirconia and it requires at least 1.5 to 2 millimeters of space. We have used it a lot and PFM which has been used frequently, requires at least 2 millimeters of space for metal coping and porcelain. There needs to be space for superstructure, which includes uh, the material thickness. After using these materials, after prosthesis type is determined, various factors are considered for implant placement. The key is placing implant in ideal position. There are three different tools to place implant well from Austin. The analog method includes positioning guide and smart guide. As of late, with the dawn of digital dentistry, digital guided surgery system has become more widely used. The use of one guide can lead to ideal implant placement. At times, you may need to do analog method placement. You can use these tools in that case. These tools are very well devised tools as well. Personally, I do all surgeries using guide system. I use one guide surgery primarily. Different systems have been developed within one guide system. Apart from the four major systems displayed, there are more options available. One guide which is the basic and one cast for sinus surgery, one MS for lower anteriors, 
if the inferior alveolar nerve canal is closed or because of sinus if the use of short implant is necessary you can use a 1485 kit and place implant in accurate positions let's look at treatment plan once again then where should we place the implant? I want to discuss so where to place the implant for prosthesis and why it should be placed there. When we do top-down approach, we need to consider buccal occlusal and sagittal view. Keeping these in mind, we need to consider implant placement position. This is the opinion from buccal view. There are many factors to consider. We need to allow the screw hole to come to the midpoint of mesiodistal width, and the placement depth so should ensure 3 millimeters of biologic width. I want to emphasize once again, we need to secure at least 9 millimeters of space, although it may differ depending on material and prosthesis type. If you look at the position from a causal view, we need to place the implant in the middle of the missing teeth. There is danger zone, ideal zone, and cantilever zone. Ideal zone is positioned at the center. By placing implant here, we can get optimum results. But that is when everything is ideal. Placing the implant in the middle can be done when extraction has been done not so long ago, but if extraction has occurred long time ago and if there is bone resorption then although we may know the ideal position we may not be able to place the implant there in sagittal view when considering the space up to the antagonist in the posterior area the ideal position for implant placement in the mandible is designed to be slightly lingual to the palatal cusp tip of the maxillary teeth the orientation is generally considered the most optimal direction for implant placement in the mandibular molars. It needs to be in line with the axis of the missing teeth. Let's look at why we need to place the implant here. When we place implants from the buccal aspect, several factors must be considered. Ideally, the implant should be positioned to maintain an appropriate distance from natural teeth as often discussed. This typically means a 1.5 mm distance from natural teeth and a 3 mm distance between implants. Additionally, the design should minimize cantilever effects, ensure vertical biologic width, and resemble the external shape of natural teeth. The space needed for the type of prosthesis and crown must also be secured. These considerations, including the implant's path of insertion, must take into account the ease of connection and removal of the prosthesis, which plays a critical role in determining the optimal direction for implant placement. There is a rule where the implant needs to be 1.5 millimeters away from natural teeth. When implant is placed, it can be closer to natural teeth. The reason why the figure 1.5 millimeters was determined is that when you place external implant, from the implant, vertically there is about 1.5 mm of uh, indentation. If the, the implant is closer to the implant than 1.5 mm, uh, then uh, the bone around the natural teeth can be resorbed. However, if inevitable, in the case of TS implant, it, it, even if it invades the space, you can still get good results. Because it's not external implant, it will be fine. In general, there needs to be 3 millimeters in between implant. This rule also stems from external implant. So, in the case of TS implant, even if the space is lacking, there may not be bone resorption. This is something that we need to take note of. In principle, we need to stick to 1.5 millimeter distance with natural tooth and 3 millimeter distance in between implants. 
That is the easy way to get implant to placement position. When you do mechanical experiments on implant, you can assess what kind of forces act as cantilever force on the implant. Based on the FE analysis, in this finite element analysis, we compare the moment value so when a load was applied 4 millimeters and then 6 millimeters from the implant's central axis. Essentially, moving from 4 millimeter to 6 millimeters signifies an increase to cantilever. This increase resulted in a 34% rise in moment value, indicating a corresponding rise in harmful forces. Hence, when forming the Implants a closal table is critical to position it centrally, keeping the cantilever effect within a 4 or 5 millimeter range on each side. Placement beyond this range, leading to an unbalanced cantilever, can escalate occlusal loads, potentially causing issues, as is illustrated in this study. We need to place the implant in the center as much as possible. The concept of biologic width is extremely important, especially for TS-type implants, where the vertical depth has a significant impact on the final outcome. Clinically, many problems arise from placing implant too shallow. It can lead to prosthetic issues as well. This is a minimal space required. The minimal required space for maintaining biologic width is 3 mm, meaning the distance from the gingival margin of the final prosthesis to the top of the implant should be at least 3 mm and preferably more. Personally, I tend to secure 4 to 5 mm. Biologic width is a critical factor related to vertical depths. Even if it means reducing the length of the implant, securing this space is crucial. This is illustrated in a clinical case from my dental clinic involving peri-implantitis. Although not visible here, there was an inflammatory reaction and bone resorption occurred, which is essentially peri-implantitis. This condition often results from implants placed too shallow, coupled with rapidly expanding emergence profile angle and low abutment cuffs, leading to complex complications such as peri-implantitis, which accompanies bone resorption and inflammation. The biggest problem is that if implant had been placed deeper, such problems could have been prevented. Most of the problems related to implant these days are associated with shallow placement. This is something that we need to take note of. If you look from the buccal view, we need to imitate the emergence profile of natural tooth. There are many opinions on this. There is a debate about whether it's ideal to mimic natural teeth exactly by using CAD CAM abutments that match the cervical diameter of natural teeth. While aesthetically pleasing and effective in preventing food impaction, it can lead to a bulkier area, particularly when implants are placed too shallow and the emergence profile is steeply angled to match the diameter of the cervical portion of natural teeth. This can lead to significant issues including gingival inflammation and bone resorption. While the goal of CAD CAM abutment is to create prosthesis similar to natural teeth, following the exact diameter of natural teeth's cervical portion can be risky. Generally, if an implant is appropriately placed and maintains a biologic width of 3 mm, as previously mentioned, using an abutment diameter of about 7 mm usually does not pose a significant problems. Personally, I use CAD CAM abutments, and the length that I measure for these usually comes to about 7 mm in most cases. This is when it is a supra margin. Buccolingual dimension becomes reduced. Gingival height needs to be at least 3 mm to be able to use a 7 mm implant. This is to mimic natural teeth, but personally, you need to use an abutment diameter that is much less than natural teeth. 
해야 된다고 저는 개인적으로 생각을 합니다. This is a clinical photo that I took. This is CAT CAM abutment and final prosthesis. You can see there's slight bone loss, but mostly it has been placed deep in the bone. The abutment margins, angles, and heights I use are quite significant, and the cuff height is approximately 4 to 5 millimeters. And I choose supra margin. And that is how I fabricate prosthesis. This area is much slender than natural teeth, allowing for additional space. Preserving this space is crucial for reducing long-term gingival inflammation and other issues. Although it may be less favorable aesthetically or in terms of food impaction, I believe that maintaining this space is very important. As I've mentioned before, the space needed for a prosthesis must be secured vertically. Considering the types and materials of prosthesis, if a space of at least 9mm is maintained in TS internal type implants, most issues would be resolved. When this space is reduced, difficulties arise in selecting materials and types for prosthesis. However, if we can ensure 9 millimeters of space from the implant placement phase to the opposing teeth, there is little to worry about regarding these issues. Next, I want to discuss about access of the implant. This is significantly influenced by connection and removal of prosthesis. The fundamental principle is that implants should be placed in a position that replicates the location of the natural tooth. It should have an axis similar to that of natural teeth. When we place implant, if the natural tooth is inclined, should we follow that? If we stick to the principle that was mentioned previously, it avoids interfering with the roots of adjacent teeth. However, in cases of inclined bone, where the implant is also inclined, discrepancies can arise between mesial and distal margins of the prosthesis. While it is essential to follow the axis of natural teeth, the path of insertion for the prosthesis must also be considered. Particularly in cases involving single crowns on teeth number 36 and 46, the direction of implant placement is critical. One might initially think that the implant should be placed in the septum. In this image, placing the implant in the septum is appropriate. Clinically, it is often more effective to position the implant slightly mesially, directing the head distally. This approach aims for a more natural prosthesis form, which mimics the natural tooth. However, specific cases might necessitate variations in this strategy. When placing multiple implants, as in the case with missing teeth number 45, 46, and 47 in the lower, the approach differs. In the mandibular left and right first molar areas, teeth number 36 and 46, targeting the septum isn't always the optimal choice. Slightly distal orientation through the mesial root can yield a more natural outcome for the patient. When placing multiple implants, as in a case with missing teeth number 45, 46, and 47, the approach differs if tooth number 44 is mesially inclined. This inclination typically influences the, the placement of subsequent implants. For tooth number 45, a similar angle to 44 is maintained, but teeth number 46 and 47 are tilted slightly distally. This orientation doesn't imply backward angulation. It is essentially a perpendicular placement considering the forward inclination of the mesial teeth. Rather than connecting all three prostheses, especially with the ER-type prosthesis, there are numerous reasons to adjust them due to the issue of food impaction between natural teeth and implants. By placing the implants in a slightly distally inclined position for each prosthesis, it facilitates the removal 
and adjustment process specifically for teeth number six and seven if you want to remove or adjust one you can do so without affecting the others due to the strategic inclination of the implants this approach provides more flexibility and ease in managing each prosthesis individually though placing implants with all same inclinations may be ideal it is not practical in terms of path of insertion, the implant in number 5 should be positioned slightly mesially as in the natural tooth, while number 6 and 7 should be placed more vertically. From a occlusal view, the implant should be ideally placed in the center. In order to get optimum results, it is better to place implants within 2 months of extraction in order to avoid a lot of issues. In most cases, buccal bone resorbs very rapidly. I believe it is more ideal to secure 1.5 mm of bone on the buccal side, 1 mm of bone on the lingual side. If you delay implant placement too much, and when you place it in the center of residual bone, at times the implant position may end up more lingual. Cantilever can be formed towards the buccal side, leading to food impaction. If cantilever is formed on the buccal side, there can be food impaction issues. Furthermore, it can be subjected to strong mechanic force leading to negative impacts on the implant. In order to prevent implant positions as shown, we need to place the implant in an ideal position before significant buccal bone gets resorbed. These days, there are a lot of different implant systems available and that is the best way to proceed. Prosthesis can be removed or connected for various reasons. Rather than cemented type prosthesis, you need to use ER type prosthesis with a screw hole. And the screw hole needs to be towards the center of a occlusal table. You're looking at several cases that I've addressed clinically. In most cases, implants have been placed in ideal position, CAD CAM abutments were used, and the screw holes are formed in the center. This was possible because guided surgery was utilized and implants were placed in ideal position. Regarding implant placement timing, we need to make a correct decision so that although there is slight bone formation within the socket, the buccal bone may not have resorbed. From sagittal view, the implant position should mimic the natural tooth's axis, but it should avoid excessive lingual inclination, especially in the mandible. More so than thought, the patient often feels a sense of foreign object because the prosthesis gets in the way of the tongue. Addressing interference of lingual space can be difficult to address and it is very sensitive to implant placement direction. You need to reduce the thickness in such cases. This is an image that I've come up with as I thought about this issue. In sagittal view of natural tooth, there is slight offset between lingual and buccal cusp. For implants, especially in the mandible, the axis is often directed towards the direction of maxillary functional cusp. The direction is ideal for implant placement and subsequent prosthesis of fabrication. Considering bone resorption patterns where the buccal bone resorbs twice as fast as the lingual bone, if you place implant after six months, it tends to shift inwards compared to the natural tooth's axis which initially points towards the maxillary palatal cusp. This is due to central positioning of the implant taking into account the bone loss. My recommendation is to slightly adjust the implant's axis towards the buccal side. By doing this, especially in the maxilla, we aim to direct the implant axis slightly more buccally than inward, preventing issues such as undercut formation as shown on the screen. By doing this, so we can prevent food impaction or undercut 
formation. Mechanically speaking, we can prevent issues related to cantilever. When we look at the axis of the implant, the occlusal forces needs to be distributed appropriately. The implant should be placed slightly inward from the palatal cusp tip. Like this. When cantilever occurs, a such moment occurs, so we need to form a crucial table accordingly. In relation to the cantilever amount, I have talked about how the occlusal contacts should not be formed too much away from central axis. This is about the cusp angle. The implant prosthesis is shown. There is flat one and one with a 15 degree of cusp angle. In the same point, when load is applied, when the prosthesis has cusp angle of 15 degrees, uh, this is the moment of value. It increases. The moment increases much more significant compared to flat one, about 81%. If you make the occlusal surface in the posterior area flat all the way, then the masticatory efficiency can go down. But if you give it too much cusp angle, just like the natural tooth compared with what is flat, the moment increases. Hence, compared to natural tooth, the occlusal table of the implant should be more flat and we need to make sure the occlusal force is towards the central fossa. Mimicking the natural tooth is the goal of implant treatment, but personally I think that the occlusal table needs to be reduced and cusp angle needs to be about 5 to 10 degrees less than natural tooth considering such mechanic factors. Let's look at a clinical case. By doing implant placement top down, problems can occur in edentulous cases. In this case, you need to use the denture teeth used by the patient. Based on that, we can make fixed prosthesis in a virtual environment. Implant placement position is evaluated and provisional is designed along with abutment. Temporary abutment and prosthesis are fabricated. Guide surgery is utilized for implant surgery. Ten implants have been placed. Transfer abutment, which is stock abutment, were connected and provisionals were delivered. This was possible because top-down approach was utilized. After a certain period of osseointegration, customized abutments were provided and prosthesis were customized as well. Top-down method is a very useful method in getting final prosthesis, so I hope you use a top-down method as you provide a treatment in your clinical practice. Today we have talked about the top-down approach and various clinical cases. In offline course, you'll be able to access more in-depth knowledge and you'll be able to look at different clinical cases as well. If you want to enhance your clinical knowledge, I hope you come to the offline master course. This is the end of my lecture. Thank you.